everyone, a warm welcome to our service today. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Enjoy the service. We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. We believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, we are indeed grateful to have been able to navigate through 2023 and years before, as most of us who are still mobile, being of sound mind, healthy enough to work if we have a job. We thank you for these privileges, Father. We, however, confess that as we are planning our year, Many of us, with lots of excitement, we neglected to acknowledge our dependence on you. For proper guidance, we further confess that we have failed during 2023 to be a crutch for those who needed us when being very vulnerable at times. We confess that because we are so occupied with our own survival and many times completely consumed with our urge to accumulate, uh, accumulate wealth many times at the expense of those who could not stand up for themselves. Dear Lord, we are really saddened and emotionally very disturbed by the gross atrocities being committed in war-torn countries, especially killing of innocent civilians in the conflict between Palestine and Israel. We confess that we are not willing to take a stand against gross atrocities committed against the victims of this conflict. As much as it is very disturbing to see 
images of women and children being killed like animals we prefer to carry on as if all is okay which is is not please help us all of us to take a firm stand on this painful situation we pray for sanity lord please forgive us lord we are now seeking your guidance for going forward during 2024 amen Today's word comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 to 12. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up the other. But woe to one who is alone and falls and does not have anyone to help. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though one might prevail against another, two will withstand one. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. As a child, one of my earliest memories is of a baton that my parents bought me because of my interest in music and especially in classical music. It was very nifty. It had a cork handle. It was light in the hands. And I used that baton a great deal conducting on my own to some of the greatest music ever composed. My favorites, Bach, um, Beethoven, uh, Mozart. 
I loved it. And I used to also do this at times for my parents uh, as they watched. And so we would, I would, we would put on Rossini's Thieving Magpie and I would conduct to, to the entire piece just for, for their pleasure and of course for mine. Since then I've continued, as you know, an interest in music and I've made it an interest of mine to listen to different recordings of the same work conducted by different composers. My father really instilled this in us because he would play, for example, an aria by, um, by Puccini, for example, and then he would play different pieces of that aria with different singers and different conductors. Now, what many people may be unaware of is that each conductor, even if they conduct on the same piece, brings out something different, even from the same music. A few weeks ago, I was asked a question by a friend uh, as to, does an orchestra really need a conductor? And of course, I, my immediate response was, of course they do. But then I, th I thought very carefully of it over the last few weeks as to why. Why did, does an orchestra need a conductor to conduct a piece of music. Now I'm going to introduce you today to a piece conducted by one particular conductor by, by the name of Leonard Bernstein or Bernstein, depending on your, if you're American or not. He was an American composer and he was a conductor. And he's going to be conducting the last part of the symphony, the second symphony of Mahler Gustav Mahler called the Resurrection Symphony. Generally, this kind of piece, this, this second symphony, needs an orchestra of over a hundred strong and a choir of over a hundred strong. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, three or four soloists. Now, let me introduce you to this particular symphony, his second symphony. Now, people often compose music, write music for various reasons. Some to worship God, others to celebrate nature, some to express joys or frustrations. Gustav Mahler, though, was distinctive in his goal. He sought not only to encompass all of these aspects, but he wanted to describe the entire world and the human experience. This was very important to him. And he embarked on this endeavor through nine very powerful symphonies of epic proportion. When I say epic proportion, huge orchestras, huge choirs, and um, also very, very powerful music that goes on for a very long time. So any particular Mahler symphony, for example, might last uh, an hour or more. His second symphony grapples with two significant questions that we would also grapple with in life. What happens after death? And the question, what is the meaning of life? Of course, these are no simple questions. They are questions that people have grappled with for years. But he, he grapples with this through the music and through the words of the singers in the music. It was, you might know this, but it was Beethoven who started bringing words into the symphony in his ninth symphony, which is, contains that famous song, Ode to Joy. So it all begins with Mahler, with a funeral. You hear the sadness of the music, you, 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 you sense that a death has occurred. And we leave the funeral with a number of questions unanswered. From a cloudless sky, a ray of sunlight illuminates a happy moment from a, pers that a person's life and, and some not so happy moments too. So you start to see, uh, you see the, the funeral, you see the death, and then you are given insight into something that happened in this person's life. This melancholic recollection doesn't last forever and the unanswered questions return. Mahler then presents us with an orchestral version of a bizarre song about the pointlessness of life. 
or the seeming pointlessness of life. There's a funny scene where St. Anthony preaches to a school of fish and at the end of the, um, of the sermon, the fish leave one by one. The sermon has pleased them, but they don't change their ways and they continue in their old habits. Moller then goes on to describe this in another way. He, he describes a scene through the music where you're watching a dance through a window, but you're hearing no music. And the turning and the twisting of the person seems senseless. He's saying basically the world looks like this when we lose ourselves, when it becomes distorted and it's reflected in a con as if it's reflected in a concave mirror. He cannot bear this feeling anymore and he expresses this in despair. He cries out. And just then, a childlike voice speaks in his ear and says these words. You are from God. Return to God. The loving God will light your way to eternal life. Next scene cuts to a terrifying vision of the apocalypse, the end of times. The earth shakes, the dead rise, they march in a mighty procession. Whether they're rich or poor, kings or beggars, all are equally terrified of two things, death and judgment. There's an eerie calm and the last trumpet sounds. Yes, the same one that is mentioned in the Bible. The end of times has come and two birds are the only beings left alive. This is when a heavenly chorus and this is when the choir sings, calls on the dead to rise again, singing that we do not live in vain. Mala finds answers to his big questions. He says, we are all saved by God. Our search for answers has led us to God. And he uses the orchestra and the voices to conjure up a breathtaking vision of eternal love, eternal life. We know and we are loved. So that's what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you the last piece of this symphony conducted by Leonard Bernstein. And I'd like you to watch specifically to be able to answer the question about conductor. What is their purpose? What is their role? Watch Leonard Bernstein. Look at his intensity. Look at his passion. And look at as he, the way he guides the orchestra and the choir through these emotional crescendos. We're going to hear these words in German, and I'm going to not speak them in German, I'm going to speak them in English. These words, these are the last words. I shall die in order to live. Rise again. Yes, rise again, will you, my heart, in an instant. What you have conquered, to God shall it carry you. Beautiful conclusion to the symphony. We're going to watch it now.
What emotions did you experience while observing him conduct this finale? How did the orchestra respond to his direction? Think about his role in interpreting this piece of music and reflect on the precision and the synchronization among the orchestra members. Any other questions that come up, you can also think about. So in answer to that question, I thought carefully of what a conductor needs, what, what he does or he or she does. Well, a few things are important. The, the conductor needs to know the score of the music. He or she needs to be a master of the score. They must have an in-depth understanding of music and especially this music. They have to know it well because they have to guide, they have to lead. And this leading is done in various ways by communicating to the, or to the orchestra and the choir different things like when they have to come in, to what note they need to come in on, um, the, the quietness or the loudness of the music. These are very important to create dynamics and the conductor needs to communicate these things. He's a leader. He leads the orchestra. The orchestra needs to be led by him. If, if he doesn't lead, someone else is going to lead. And if he doesn't lead, then the entire piece falls flat. He needs emotional intelligence. He has to convey emotions, but not make them too so crude and so overboard that they are sickening for us. He needs to convey it in the way that the person who wrote the music wants him to convey it. They need patience, patience with this orchestra, because it takes time to develop an interpretation of a piece. But above all, the conductor needs vision. He needs to take his vision of the music and convey that to the orchestra. Another conductor will convey a different vision of even the same piece of music. And he needs humility. Because in the end, the piece is not about him. This is not about someone being self-absorbed. It's about someone leading people to listen to the music. As if the conductor can be the, a minimalist, where he's, he, he leads strongly, but his, his role is not to draw attention to himself, then he's really a good conductor. Bernstein was very, a very um, charismatic conductor. He had a very particular style. At one point, there's a beautiful video of him conducting. He didn't have his baton with just his eyes. He conducts with just his eyes. What is important about conducting an orchestra? It is a vision. The vision of the piece. Um, we need the conductor to provide a unique vision. We also need him because he is serving something beyond himself as the orchestra is doing. So we need him first for vision. Then secondly, we need him because he serves something beyond himself. He's serving the music and he's calling upon the musicians and the choir to serve the music too. It doesn't help if someone just goes off on a tangent with a wrong note or a wrong piece of music because that will, will harm the whole because he's there to serve the music. That's, that's most important. Thirdly, each person is significant and the conductor knows this good conductor will make sure that each person's individual contribution is important and brought in to flavor the whole. Regardless of the size, you could be a triangle or a person who plays the triangle, or you could be someone who plays the double bass. 
uh, regardless of, of size or prominence, each part of the orchestra is important. Now it struck me as I was thinking about it, this is my fourth point, or fifth point, I'm not sure. What is the most important thing in the orchestra itself? Some might think obedience to the conductor, but no, I, I thought about it very carefully. Obedience is not really part of the musical world. What is necessary is unity. There needs to be unity. And that is the job of the, the conductor, to create unity, not unity in terms of uniformity, not every piece, every instrument playing exactly the same, but unity in the sense of everybody playing, uh, playing together and synchronizing the beauty of the music. Obedience is not the key here. It is unity and synchronization. There's a wonderful story by, about Sir Thomas Beecham, who was a famous uh, conductor of the London Philharmonic. And he once traveled to a certain city to appear as the guest conductor for an orchestra. And during the first rehearsal, he noticed very quickly that the orchestra was not well trained. And as the rehearsal continued, he became more and more frustrated. Finally, he had to stop the musicians for the third time at the same place in the school. One of the musicians protested and said, well, just how do you want us to play? And Beecher looked at him and calmly suggested, together, together. It may not be about obedience, but it is about discipline. Every one of those instruments, people who play those instruments, have to go home and practice, develop their talent, practice notes, go through, through scores of music in order to hone their talents, to be able to play in the orchestra. And then when they're in the orchestra, they want to play at their best. They want to serve the music they want to listen carefully to the conductor and follow his vision for the music. The Bible says, tells us who our conductor is. I'm just going straight there. Our conductor, it's not John Cominos, it's not any other minister. Our conductor is Jesus. In the end, we serve him. We watch him, we hear him. The Bible says, for we who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. The Bible says, God placed all things under his feet and appointed him head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The Bible says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. The Bible says, Jesus said himself, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Our role as individuals, as being part of the orchestra of God, is to serve this Jesus, to watch him, to listen to him, to be attentive to him and to allow him to create a vision for us. A vision for us here at BBC. We need our conductor to lead us. But in order for him to lead us, we need to watch him, to listen, to be aware of his every gesture so that we can follow him in serving the beauty of God. Years ago, I was singing in a choir, a school choir, and I was so excited to be, be part of the school choir that I remember we were on a stage, actually ironically, I think in a Presbyterian church, this whole uh, 50 strong choir, and I was sitting on the edge of the um, stage. And um, 
I was so interested in the fact that we were singing this piece that my eyes were going all over the place. I was watching people, I was looking for beautiful girls. I was enjoying the fact that we were singing and I was singing at the top of my voice. At the end of that performance, the teacher, her name was Janet Swart, I remember very clearly. She called me to come, you must come here. And I went to her and she was also, by the way, the conductor of the choir. She said, Kominos, if you do not keep your eyes focused on me during the performance, you won't be in this choir for very long. After that, I never took my eyes off her. Every performance, I was very attentive to this conductor. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God, Help us to keep our eyes on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith, the one who leads us, the one who brings us a vision, the one who makes us into something beautiful for others. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, 
may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God.